African studies knew about it, but many others did not. And so we wanted to, we thought an anthology would be a way to get this going beyond um, what, what's visible on the internet. And the other part of it is that we really believe in relational leadership. So we wanted to bring everybody together, not just to contribute singular chapters, but to be in dialogue. And so um, in January of 2019 at UC Santa Barbara, we organized a symposium that has most of the contributors in this book. And we came together both to give public talks, but also to, to meet in closed door sessions. And so we had all kinds of dialogues about the state of Asian American organizing, um, what needs to change, what our own struggles have been. Um, and and um, it was really vibrant. And that became this book. And the book centers around many things, but I think I'll focus it on four questions. So one is the question of how we actually create change. And here we were looking at not just doing one-off events, the work of sort of activists, which are very important, but the work of organizers, those who are building across the long haul, who are looking to build transformative justice, campaigns, movements, really difficult work. And so we are trying to center organizing knowledge and we subtitled our book, Building Movements for Liberation. The second thing that we were looking at is how does Asian American activism build across generations? So we were looking at intergenerationality and we make the claim that current day Asian American activism can't be understood without its impact uh, being rooted in the Asian American movement of 50 years ago. And so we have people like Pam Tao Lee who gave the keynote at that symposium and who has done incredible work in the radical Asian American movement in groups like Iwa Kun and also led out in the people of color movement for what now we think about as environmental justice, right, which also centers anti-racism. Um, three, we were looking at what kinds of critiques we need when we think about praxis, the unity of theory and practice, what kinds of practice, what kind of critiques represent um, Asian American activism, though it's widespread and though it's heterogeneous, we really see through lines as fighting structural white supremacy, racial capitalism and imperialism. And we wanted that to be known about Asian American activism. And the fourth was a question of how we lead, right? What kind of organizing models we use. And for us in the Asian American movement of 50 years ago, it really rested in collective leadership. And as I said, relational leadership. Um, in the book are 12 chapters that uh, cut across diverse ethnic backgrounds that um, are more California based, but national as well, that include community organizers as well as activist scholars, uh, chapters such as Angela Cabande's looking at SOMCON, uh, resisting displacements in San Francisco and building community uh, in the South of Market area. Mei Fu, who was looking at political education happening outside the academy in our communities, in Nepalese, Vietnamese and Southeast Asian communities in New York City, Providence, and Southern California, and Karen Umemoto, who was looking at restorative model, justice models in Hawaii that rested on Native Hawaiian or Kanaka Maoli epistemologies. If you're interested in seeing a panel we did a week ago that's posted on Haymarket Press's YouTube channel, it features Javi Tariq of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance and Alex Tom, who worked for many years with the Chinese Progressive Association and the lessons that they have to share about movement organizing. I'm gonna turn next to my chapter that I did on the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. And I was, I learned so much in this interview with Jave Tariq, who I had known for um, years since he had come out to Santa Barbara to speak. And the New York Taxi Workers Alliance is this really incredible organization that's doing major organizing um, right as we speak. And um, they formed in the 1990s. They formed as a, a lease drivers coalition, the first workers coalition of the coalition of CAF, the, Co the coalition against anti-Asian violence, which itself emerged out of the um, struggles around the Vincent Chin case. And 
They organized, uh, for example, in 1998, a historic one-day strike of uh, 12,000 taxi workers in New York City. And more recently, they intervened in this neoliberal economy, which is creating this gig economy, right, which creates only part-time work, right, that, that rests on austerity. And when Uber and Lyft drivers flooded the New York um, uh, driver market, rather than separating their work, right, or, or seeing them as competition, they organized together in the model of the international workers of the world, right, that wobbly model of organizing everybody within the same industry. And in doing so, they were able to make significant wins, such as getting app-based drivers recognized as employees entitled to certain rights rather than independent contractors. And in this moment of COVID, they organized tremendously. They talk about taxi drivers as frontline um, workers who are ambassadors for New York, right? Who after immigration, they're picking up international travelers in, in New York City um, airports and yet didn't have protection. And so they, they found that and reported to them 62 taxi workers died in the first three months of COVID, 10,000 taxi drivers uh, contacted them and they did a lot of services to get out information to taxi drivers about um, housing subsidies, unemployment and other kinds of things that were really important. And so their work is both labor organizing but it also spans um, all of this. And 60, uh, the majority of their, their workers are South Asian taxi cab drivers, but they're also organizing in multilingual ways, doing just really incredible work. I'll stop there and turn it to the next person. Well, thank you very much, uh, Diane. And I can't believe how much knowledge you just dropped on us. Uh, just in that a short time. I think that's why people definitely need to get that book. Um, not that I, you know, have anything to do with anything. But uh, happy new breath, everyone. Uh, my name is Eddie Zhang. I'm the president and founder of the New Breath Foundation. And it's definitely a privilege and honor for me to share uh, this space uh, with so many wonderful um, and amazing uh, scholars and activists. Um, of course, everyone that who is uh, you know on this you know panel right here. <sighs> you know, the New Birth Foundation uh, started out from just underneath the, the fact of the inequity in distribution of resources in the institution of philanthropy. Uh, when we look at uh, some of the reports being done over the years uh, to uh, Asian American Pacific Islander in philanthropy and other sources, um, we understood that only 0.2% less of the, those resources um, are going to marginalize Asian American Pacific Islander community. And that's definitely unacceptable. So the New Bright Foundation started from that uh, value of addressing the inequity uh, in our AAPI community. And uh, we offer hope and healing and new beginnings for Asian American Pacific Islander immigrants and refugees people who are impacted by incarceration, deportation, and survival of violence. Uh, what we wanted to do is to mobilize the resources, right, to build power, capacity, infrastructures uh, for our community. And my chapter uh, in this book of um, contemporary Asian American activism, really looking at the connection of um, intergeneration uh, trauma, and looking at how mass incarceration and deportation and United States foreign policy impact by right, the AAPI community. And really, as well as really focusing on how, uh, when we are connecting to our history and culture, we're able to really learn to beginning to address the systemic issues that really plague all of our communities. And through that process, how uh, elders, Right, and students can activate right, to support people who are incarcerated, that who wanted to learn their culture and history, who wanted to uh, create a space uh, for people to achieve their mental freedom 
and how the administration within the prison industry complex is uh, punishing those people who are advocating for their basic rights and then also their right to understand where they came from and how they got here. Um, so in that space, uh, it really documents the movement you know, of Asian Prisoner Support Committee and how it is uh, using lived experience of those who are directly impacted to create systemic changes. So I'm grateful uh, to be able to be a contributor to this chapter and definitely want to talk more. And uh, with that, I'll just pass it on to my next colleague. Hi, everyone. I'm Kayong Chung, assistant professor in Asian American studies at UC Davis, and also a proud board member at NACASEC. It has been my great honor to be a part of this amazing research and activist project. And also, I appreciate Diane, Robin, and also East Wind's books and the University of Washington Press for helping us like sharing this like chapters with our larger community. In my chapter, I argue how education allowed the undocumented Korean activists to be uniquely positioned to challenge depictions of, the, of themselves as quote unquote deserving or disposable, the two dominant narratives framing undocumented immigration. Their aspiration for education was at first shaped by the pressure to prove their citizen worthiness through conformity to the existing system. But at the same time, education also became a way for them to fight for justice for everyone. For instance, their liminal and precarious living experiences coupled with persistent racialization in the United States motivated them to create radical spaces for racial dialogue through multiracial, intergenerational, and intersectional solidarity with other minoritized groups. So in my chapter, I argue that ultimately, young undocumented Korean immigrants are helping us to create a new vision of Asian American activism and inspire us reimagine the world we want to live in, in an era of this continued US imperialism and uneven globalization. My chapter draws on my multi-sided and community-based participatory research from 2013 to 2020. I conducted this research in LA, Chicago, New York, and Annandale, Virginia, working closely with Korean American organizations, including the NACASEC, HANA Center, Minkwon Center, and Korean Resource Center. By working, cooking, and living together, with young undocumented Korean activists, I was able to gain a deeper understanding about their life experiences. I also worked as a campaign assistant, summer youth program facilitator, and as a translator for Korean media outlets. By contributing to their activism with my ability as a native Korean speaker, and my former experiences organizing undocumented migrant workers back in South Korea, I was able to participate in and contribute to the community I was researching. Although I was called as a doctorate student from Illinois at the beginning of my research field work, at some point I became more often called a quote unquote Korean Korean sister, a supporter of undocumented Koreans, and later a fellow activist. My chapter was structured analyzed and written with the hope that their challenges and stories will become more visible. In spite of all the emotional challenges of looking back on the painful moments and struggles they had experienced, my research collaborators, my research participants chose to join my research because they believed that the voices of undocumented Korean, undocumented Asian immigrants should be recorded and heard in public. I believe and hope that my participation in today's book talk event can be a part of that effort to make their struggles and beautiful contributions to our radical movement to be more heard and recognized in public. Again, thanks for having me here today. 
Hello, thanks everybody. I'm so honored to be here with you all uh, to speak on the chapter of this book contributed by Bayan USA. Uh, Bayan USA was the first overseas chapter of the Philippine-based Bagong Aliansang Makabayan or New Patriotic Alliance, a nationwide multi-sectoral alliance of over 1,000 grassroots people's organizations in the Philippines fighting for national and social liberation. Uh, wanted to give a shout out to Jessica Antonio, who is our propaganda officer and was the principal author of the chapter, uh, without whom it wouldn't have been written. Uh, Jessica isn't able to join us today. She's on maternity leave, but shout out to Jess. Um, so our chapter prevents, uh, presents a view into Filipino radical activism in the U.S. in the 21st century, with a particular focus on why and how Filipino activists in the US play an integral role in educating, organizing, and mobilizing their local communities to contribute to advancing the national liberation movement of the country. Um, so our chapter begins by taking a look at why this organizing is necessary in the first place. Um, we established that the Philippines may be considered an independent country in name, but in reality, we still have this neo-colonial relationship with the US. So meaning that everything Thing from our economy to our culture to political life is subsumed to the interests of the U.S. and particularly U.S. imperialism. Uh, we also still suffer from the problem of a semi-feudal economy, which keeps the majority of the country's people in poverty. And so because of these conditions, Filipinos have been forced out of our homeland. And at present, our community number is at least 4 million strong and growing in the U.S., the largest concentration of Filipinos outside the Philippines. Um, our chapter goes on to describe how Filipinos residing in the U.S. are driven to connect their history, their culture, uh, and homeland through community organizing uh, and educational exposure trips to the Philippines with the most oppressed sectors of Philippine society, um, particularly uh, peasants, workers, and indigenous people. Um, in the chapter, you'll get to read interviews with Filipino activists in the diaspora who describe how their deep connection to the homeland developed through activism. Uh, for example, so some of the people interviewed were born in the Philippines and migrated to the US. They became politicized through investigation into their own family migration story. Pretty common story of leaving the homeland in order to find work abroad in order to survive. Uh, they met by an USA or one of our member organizations who were organizing on issues of immigrant rights. Um, as one interviewee said, quote, uh, I saw that they were doing work in the community while also providing comprehensive political education. Learning about forced migration and imperialism contextualized my own life in a way I'd never been able to articulate before. Um, their analysis provided also landed on a concrete way to take action, to continue serving the people. Um, other people interviewed in the chapter were involved in political issues based in the U.S. and then got introduced to our organizations. So uh, another person interviewed in the book said, quote, I was getting more politicized by seeing the Standing Rock and Black Lives Matter movements. I saw Anik Bayan uh, was the only Filipino organization really standing in solidarity. Then I learned about our own struggle and it confirmed all the feelings I felt growing up here in the States. It made me feel the connection to home that I've been longing for. Um, our chapter ends with a description of how our Bayan USA's exposure programs are essential in teaching young activists, uh, you know, whether they're born in the US or born in the Philippines, about the concrete conditions of Philippine society um, that have driven so many to migrate around the world. So these trips have become an essential way that activists get a chance to understand these conditions firsthand. Um, and, you know, more importantly, they get to talk to people, people who live um, day in and day out under these conditions, uh, people who want their stories to be told around the world so that they will no longer uh, be hidden from the outside world and that so more people will care and take action to change these conditions. Um, these interviews feature stories from the front lines. Um, and I'll end with um, just one last quote, which I think really exemplifies um, those stories which are just calling out to be heard and um, the stories which uh, inspire so much of the activism in our community. So this uh, story um, uh, is quoted uh, by a member of the women's organization, Gabriella Seattle, uh, quote, 
there was a woman I met whose brother and nephew was just killed by the armed forces of the Philippines as they were farming. I remember she was explaining to us what they did to them and she put her wrists together and showed us how they shot them and bound their hands with the abaca they were farming. I have that image burned into my memory. The tears in her eyes, her hands raised up wrist to wrist. She was looking straight into my eyes. She just wanted her story to be told. So overall, our chapter describes uh, radical Filipino activism by sharing the stories of Filipino activists who have found this sense of purpose and responsibility in organizing communities in the US and connecting their local issues to national and an international level and participating in the movement for national democracy in the Philippines. I'm happy to be here today and thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. It's so wonderful to see such a packed uh, room, a Zoom room, that we have uh, now the event live streaming on YouTube. So my name is Robin Rodriguez, and I was introduced earlier. I am the co-editor, uh, a co-editor with Dr. Diane Pugino, who is also my professor, now colleague, uh, co-editor of the anthology. Uh, and as such, I uh, helped to bring the folks together that um, contributed to the, the book, also helped to, to co-write the introduction, but I also have two uh, sole authored uh, contributions to the book that I, I'm going to speak to um, a little bit now and then a little bit later. But one of the things I just wanted to say is, you know, I've actually been a community organizer much, much longer than I've been a professor. I started organizing um, in the 80s, in the late 80s as a high school student already. Um, but more recently, where I live here, I live in the greater Sacramento region. I'm really proud to have been part of the founding of the what's now called the Asian American Liberation Network. We were uh, formed during the pandemic and officially launched just last week as a, an official nonprofit organization. So very, very pleased to have been part of that. I think though probably my best contribution as an organizer is frankly having been mother to Amado Kaya Canem Rodriguez, who I will also talk a little bit about later um, and is the subject of the song that was sung earlier by, by Kiwi. Now, what I'm gonna talk about just now because I, again, I had several contributions, but I really want to talk about the chapter that I wrote on my activism. So the title of my chapter um, was drawing from Tupac Shakur, and it was Pete Wilson trying to see us all broke, uh, Asian American cross-racial student activism in the 1990s California. I mean, Tupac really uh, was able to really articulate, I think so many of our experiences uh, of growing up in California. And actually for a very long time, I'd really wanted to write I still want to write that book, the entire book on Asian American activism in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, I'll get to that, but for now, what I uh, what I wanted to be able to do for at least this this uh, book was at least start that process of really thinking about the significance of what we contributed uh, as organizers in the 1990s. So I really decided to reflect primarily on my student activism. Um, and, and, and the bulk of my chapter really focuses on the few years I was at UC Santa Barbara. I had transferred to UC Santa Barbara in 1993, kind of hit the ground run, running as an organizer. And you know, part of why I wanted to focus on student organizing in particular, really had a lot has a lot to do with intergenerational knowledge that I received from Filipino anti-martial law activists. So I had met these anti-martial law activists already after I had graduated from UC Santa Barbara, um, but I remember one of the things that they would really emphasize with me and, and a generation of folks, including I think uh, Rhonda, we were mentored by many of the same people, but a lot of the things I would always emphasize is the importance of, of organizing as students. There's a distinctiveness about student organizing that was so important. They would you know, always remind us that um, the anti-martial law movement really could trace its starts to the first quarter storm, which was a movement led by students. They would share these writings with, with me and so many of uh, uh, my other kind of contemporaries of, by Philippine writers, but also other third world revolutionaries of earlier generations who always theorized about the distinctiveness 
of the role of students in bringing about uh, social change. So I think that all of that had helped me to realize that we were doing something really critical and vital when we were organizing at stu as students um, at UC Santa Barbara. I'm not gonna give away everything because I encourage you to buy the book, <laughs> but I do wanna say there are two key lessons in reflecting from our organizing on campus um, in the 1990s that I try to uh, convey in the chapter. And one is that one of the most powerful things about being a student organizer is because is that your job quite simply is to study so vital that actually when you're a student that is the role the role your your responsibility your primary responsibility is to study and i think one of the things that you'll you know for those of us on the other side um you know there, there's really no other time in your life no other time in your life when you can engage in full-time study to really um engage ideas uh, collectively, whether it's in the classroom or, or outside of the classroom. And I think that's one of the really important ways that students can contribute to movement building is simply by studying. And again, whether that happens in the context of the classroom or outside of it, that, that you have this period of your life when that is kind of your role, um, that can be so important to social movement work. Another major important um, contribution that student movements have made or that students make to social movements is the mere kind of sociality of co college life, right? The fact that you're collectively um, gathered in one place, in classrooms, in living situations, and that really um, is what a, a accounts for so much of uh, the ways that students have been able to topple dictators like in the Philippines or in so many other places around the world, really kind of confront the, the, the state and, and all of um, the ways that it causes violence to our communities, uh, students are able to mobilize in a way that is not always true for many people uh, because of the way that you kind of, again, you're living together, you're working together in, in college classrooms. And so those are some of the lessons that I wanted to kind of share with all of you, but are, uh, you know, of course, go into much more detail in, in the book. Something, you know, that I hope that all of you, because I think a, a good number of you who are tuning in are actually college students, that I, I hope that just even this brief overview of the chapter will invite you to consider the unique ways you can contribute to social movement work as a student, because history has shown us that you can, and history will show us that you will. So thank you. Thank you, Robin. And uh, so the next part here is um, we, we have a, a, a set of uh, questions. And after that, we'll have, we'll take questions from the audience. Um, just bouncing off of what uh, Robin stated about how social movements, because of the particular nature of students and campus and community and the collectivity that's built, uh, lot, social movements, are influenced by what happens on campus, and then it spills out into the community. Uh, so the first question I have is uh, to Eddie, who was actually influenced by uh, students when you were incarcerated um, <clears throat> through uh, the passing on of Asian American studies and ethnic studies, and then off of that, you became an activist. Uh, but also you face uh, reprisals for your participation. So one question I had was, uh, in prison, you face reprisals for being part of a group that led prisoners' demands for ethnic studies, and you went through the solitary confinement for that. Uh, what helped you persevere, uh, even though you had to face uh, repercussions? And how did you see this experience, uh, the result of this experience, uh, into some type of progress, you know, how, how, how did you go beyond the reprisals, you know, to build your commitment? And um, connected with that is also what helped you develop your critical thinking skills, you know, from this process, okay? You use, you use the term chi, uh, C-H-I, culture, history, and identity. How does that all work, okay? But in other words, how did you get started, you know? Harvey, can you repeat the whole thing again? <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Harvey. Um, man, where, where do I start, right? I mean, I, uh, 
not to put put you on the pedestal, Harvey, is because of you and uh, the elders like you, right? That who lay your lives down, and to be able to, uh, you know, stood up and advocate, right? 1968, or prior to 1968 and, and 1968, 60, 69 to now, and continue to um, mentor students and uh, mentor people in the community. That's uh, where where I've arrived, and uh, so for me, in the invisibility of Asian American Pacific Islander, especially many of the Southeast Asian Pacific Islander uh, folks, is already a shame. You know, in in the prison industry complex, where it's driven by profit off of people's back, right? So when we're looking at the Thirteenth Amendment of the United States Constitution, where uh, legalized indentured servitude is still legal, right? Like when I say legalized, it's still allowed. Then uh, the only way to be able to have a better understanding of that uh, legalization of uh, voluntary uh, forced uh, enslavement, we have to look at education, right? And how the failure of education created that school to prison deportation pipeline. And uh, that's why I always talking about the importance of tapping into the chi, right? And, and the chi that I'm talking about is not just the breath and, and the life force that's sustaining our lives, but really focus on cultural history and identity in the sense of how do we invest in ethnic studies, and Asian American studies, right? And women's studies and global studies as a part of the lineage that was fought and, and earned through many of the activists who came before us to allow us to have that opportunity. So within the prison system, because we are racially segregated and because we are continue to uh, being treated even in the prison system as a minority within minorities, right? And that, mi that minority within minority is based on the fact that uh, in the larger scale, the AAPI population is still uh, a very small percentage when we look at the overrepresentation of the black and brown and indigenous community uh, in, in the prison industry complex. So we became uh, the minority of the minorities, but yet within that, we are the model minorities, right? And so from, from that, we know that uh, education, especially culturally competent education is not afforded to uh, the AAPI folks. And so therefore um, it was out of sheer either one individual will Right, that wanted to invest in learning, or it has to do with the people from the outside that who inspire, encourage people that who is being isolated from a society to be able to learn. And so, uh, as a result of that, you know, for me, me and myself, uh, myself and two of my uh, friends that who actually were punished right, by putting by being in solitary to confine, uh, sol solitary confinement, um, was because we were AAPIs and because we were wanting to challenge the administration, right, uh, in, in this uh, practices of dehumanizing people and forbidding people from uh, advocating for what, what they want. And so in that sense, uh, we were able to really come together to really follow our hearts, you know, and what was the right thing to do for us to gain uh, this, you know, mental freedom that we so much were hungry for, right, in this space. But ultimately, uh, what we came together to do was to really looking at how uh, important it is that we have to develop the critical thinking education. And how I have developed it is people like many of the students that you have, as a matter of fact, uh, Jeannie Lo, who used to work uh, at East Wind, you know, and many of the other uh, students from Berkeley who came in really to kind of demonstrate to us how young people are also following uh, the first step of the elders to advocate and maintain the right of having ethnic studies and Asian American studies as a core curriculum, right? And so when I'm talking about tapping into the chi, it's really not only talking about uh, our own uh, culture, history, and identity, but really how do we learn about other people of color's culture, history, and identity so we can better humanize each other, right? And so from that end, we were able to um, get the support, not only from the activists and students out here, but, you know, Yuri Kochiyama, our elder who really uh, brought people together and created the Asian Prisoner Support Committee, right? And from there, we can see that through our advocacy, 
how Asian prison support community have become a movement to really advocate for the currently and formerly incarcerated uh, individuals, and then also create spaces for more opportunities to, for people to really uh, address the intergenerational trauma through ethnic studies. So therefore, Roots was created and Roots was co-founded by many of the uh, impacted individuals who were serving time in San Quentin State Prison, right? So the acronym for ROOTS is Restoring Our Original True Selves. So um, APSC was able to go back into the, uh, in the prison system to really uh, create curriculums that model after ethnic studies to, uh, to seek to address um, uh, understanding of how US foreign policy, how uh, the immigration and refugee histories and, and stories has uh, created those harm for many of the harm people to hurt other people, right? So in that space, we're able to not only develop leadership skills, we were able to try to create spaces beyond prison. So once they were able to participate in, in those uh, studies, they will understand that ha they have value, right? That attached to prior to when they committed a crime or, or when they inflicted harm. And so in that process alone, they were able to really find healing and then find spaces for uh, res uh, taking responsibility for their actions and then to transform themselves so they can uh, uh, find, find a space where they can be a contributing member of society. So hence, when, we, when, you, when you ask the question, uh, Harvey, how, how has that kind of created an impact? Uh, so it's that, that lineage of all the, uh, the activists and the people that who uh, stood up and who made sacrifices continued right, to this generation and hopefully with, with this uh, anthology, many of the future generation will be able to kind of look at and learn from right, all the activism that's happened uh, within the AAPI community. And so I just wanna close out by saying that uh, since then, you know, we were able to really for APSC has expanded into an unanticipated movement it became national and international because they're supporting people that who are impacted by incarcerated deportation that were deported to the Philippines, to Vietnam, to Cambodia, right? And which people are still uh, fighting against this deportation right now for the separation of family uh, as a result of the United States policies uh, domestically and, and internationally. And so uh, there's the Roots to Reentry and New Breath Foundation uh, this foundation is because of the movement that started right in 2002 when Asian Prison Support Committee was formed. So I want to say that uh, uh, again, you know, I remember when I was in, inside a, a system in prison, and I was becoming well read, right? Because I'm trying to put my hand in all the literature I can get, and I just can't uh, say enough that many of the uh, scholars are here uh, on this panel here, especially uh, uh, Diane Fugino. Um, I just remember reading all her writings, right? And I'm reading some of Robin's writings. And you know, so those are the literature that we don't have access to unless it's been from people out there who sent it to us, right? To learn about the history and culture. So those are the things that we need, right? To be able to own that narrative and dictate our narrative. So people don't rewrite our history to diminishing us or, or to silence us, especially in these days when many of the gender-based violence is happening uh, in our community, in, the, in this patriarchal society that we're still uh, living under. So with that, I'll, I'll just uh, close my thought right there and I appreciate that question, Harvey. Okay, thank you, Eddie. Uh, a question for uh, Diane. Um, for Gino, um, her article, your article, Drivers on the Front Lines, the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, Neoliberalism in the Global Pandemic, an interview with Javid Tariq. Uh, one question that I had was, um, uh, what is the significance of looking into the work of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance for understanding future directions of Asian American activism, because uh, a lot of the, the, the writings about Asian American activism uh, seems to not be a big focus on working class and labor type issues. So I, I was just wondering from 
yourself doing this interview and writing it and reflecting on it, do you think that Asian American studies today is not going deep enough uh, into the issues of class and class solidarity? And how does that tie into Asian American studies? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Harvey. I think that this is a crucial question, right? Um, and in fact, the New York Taxi Workers Alliance split from CAV precisely over some of these issues. I mean, they get along well, they, they're connected. It's not that there was an antagonistic split, but that they wanted to form their own organization that wasn't just pri primarily focused on, you know, anti-Asian violence, right, which CAV formed around, which was so important given the vulnerabilities of taxi workers to constant threats and, you know, of violence. Um, but they wanted to form a workers organization and they wanted to form a workers organization with workers in the leadership. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we have so much to learn from them. Um, I was listening to Robin talking about how one of the important things about student organizing is that people are in the same space together. Right. And I was thinking, Robin, what does it mean to be in COVID? Right. But I, I was also thinking about labor organizing and how one of the things that at least the older model was we're in the same space, we're in the same factories, we're in the same offices. And that provides us with opportunities to learn, to organize, to build social relationships that become important for the for the organizing. But the taxi workers don't have that space, right? There's a mobility to the way taxi workers do things. And there's also that linguistic challenge, right? I mean, I think people talk about multicultural organizing as being different because there's people have different cultures and values and misunderstandings. But when you don't even speak the same language, and one of the things that Javid Tariq talked about was how when two taxi drivers lined up at a red light, so this means they don't have a lot of time, but that don't talk to the person from your same background, talk to somebody from a different background. So that was something that they were consciously trying to do. And the, and the organizing and the mobilizing had to be quick and nimble. Um, the majority of the workers, as I said, are South Asian, Pakistan, Bangladesh, from India. And the, 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 you know, it's not like there's an assumption that uh, groups necessarily get along, right? There's like war going on between different countries and they had to breach all of this. So I think that there's so much that, and, and, and the ways that they were able to be quick and nimble to, a, to address the kinds of ways that neoliberalism was impacting labor and the part-timeization of labor, right? And it's kind of austerity. I think there are a lot of lessons to be had for us in, in kind of the current and future of organizing, that it isn't just the old models, but it's this quick and nimble way of working and that it will be the people most impacted who are in the leadership of these organizations. So the workers themselves leading uh, working class issues. Um, and I guess the final thing I wanna say, Harvey, to your point, right, is that the model minority, right, image covers up the working class Asian American uh, in, in our community. And yet there's so much and so many Asian Americans suffering in all kinds of ways. And we need to address that in our organizing. And we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, I had one question for all of the panelists. It's how can this book be taught and discussed or introduced into our communities? And how do you envision the audience engaging with this book? Um, what are the key lessons that you're hoping the audience um, will take from it? And yeah, what does this book offer that's, that's different? So anyone can take a stab at it. <laughs> Why don't we um, start with uh, Ga Young? Thanks, Jenny, for your question. I believe the most unique contribution of our book is that we are covering the most up-to-date activism, the very radical activism that has been initiated and and um, preceded by AAPI communities in the United States. And um, as you can find from our um, like contributors chapters, it is not only dealing with the issues of race, for instance, citizenship, but also it is dealing with lots of various topics such as gentrification, climate change, and um, 
like social justice issues, which are not only happening in the United States, but also shared um, as big issues around the globe. I believe that our book that is really highlighting the intergenerational as well as transnational and multiracial and intersectional approaches and activism can inspire a lot of current activists as well as scholars, most importantly, our students and next generations, when they want to um, rediscuss like what forms of activism and activist learning they want to have and um, like develop throughout their community organizing. I can jump in next. I, mean, I couldn't agree with uh, Young more. And I was just um, reflecting on Diane's uh, description of uh, the workers in New York, the taxi workers who uh, really connected their struggle to neoliberalism. And one of the things that I think this book does is that it um, shows how the many struggles presented, uh, no matter what community, um, are connected by common things like the attacks of neoliberalism, um, the uh, way U.S. imperialism kind of run through, runs through it all and um, shows that there are many different ways in which uh, communities are resisting. And so one of the things that I hope this book can be used for um, is to draw that kind of solidarity among peoples, you know, where society is trying to divide us uh, read this book, understand the struggles, understand how the struggles are connected uh, in so many different ways, and then uh, be inspired by the ways people are organizing uh, in resistance. I wanna um, amplify something that Eddie was talking about. You know, um, he was put in solitary along with his two comrades, right? In prison in San Quentin, because they were organizing for, <laughs> to get Asian American studies in the prisons, right? There's the whole ethnic studies movement happening in the high schools right now. And I feel like this book is about Asian American studies and ethnic studies and showing the kind of that social history, the one that you're talking about, Harvey, where ordinary people are creating change, right? We're creating the world we want to see and we wanna live in. And that's what this book is about. And it's fundamentally about race-based movements, intersectional justice, and it's the kind of, ethnic studies that Eddie was fighting for, right? That Robin was talking about our students reading and transforming their lives. So I was thinking, I hope that this book and Eddie, we're gonna have to figure this out. I know you're working on something to get the book inside the prisons, right? I, I also to get it to community organizations, to university classrooms. And also I'm thinking both events, but also study groups and also really using this to think about how we create those movements for liberation, right? Across the long run, because we are, as I said earlier, we're really trying to center organizing knowledge. This, I have so much respect for these long-term organizers, including those people on this Zoom call who struggle day in and day out. It's not just the things that get media attention, it's really hard work, it's struggle. And we are trying to, to highlight that and to think very seriously about how we create a new world. Yeah, the other thing I, I want to add why this, is, this book is important is it kind of connects to the theory and the praxis, right? So sometimes, you know, we, you know, we talk, we learn and we study and then the act of planting the seed of knowledge, right? It is that the theory, it is already uh, engaging in that praxis. But you know, for people that who who are we highlighting, you know, in, in this these chapters, and of course we we're not, you know, it's not a, not a comprehensive like a encyclopedia kind of a, a, a book, you know. But it really just a glimpse towards the how when people will live experiences, right, and, and it's sharing how the practice of activism and bringing people together and building community and leading. Uh, with with that, you know, mindset of how are we going to be able to fight for our freedom and then also fight for the freedom of others, right? And that I think that's important. And it's not so much of external only, but more so of this book will allow you the opportunity to focus on internally how is it connecting to you, right? And your uh, mental struggles where as you see all the injustice and you read about all this, you know how 
these type of things will activate you uh, to become a better person. And I think this book will have the opportunity to do that. Thank you for that, Eddie. Uh, just to add in a kind of close out this part so that we can transition into uh, addressing some of the questions that might be coming in on, on the chat and even through uh, YouTube. I wanna kind of uh, emphasize uh, or just lift up again what Diane has already said uh, as well as Eddie and what, what everybody's already really said. I mean, one is that I think one of the things we've always envisioned is that this is not just a book to be to be read and set on a shelf. This is meant to invite uh, readers to engage. So we're really, um, I mean, there are a couple of ways that we're hoping to invite people to engage in activist struggle, especially around the Asian American community. So one thing, and I'll drop this in the chat, is we actually created a website for the book. And I'm, uh, a part of the hope as we go along is to be able to not only share more updated information about the movements that are discussed in the book, but also to be able to share um, resources that will allow a different sorts of people to study the book. I mean, obviously I think, you know, being able to do events like this with East Wind and other uh, venues is great for being able to share some of the insights from the book. Uh, but we, we definitely hope that it goes beyond um, uh, the college classroom. I mean, obviously we care about college students reading it. College students were a very, very main audience for us, but we encourage college students to not just uh, read the book if it happens to, you know, come across your desk in a class. We encourage you to do that work of self-study. That was a lot of the wonderful lesson. That was a key lesson we learned from uh, previous uh, student movements is the importance of sort of self uh, self study, but still in in a collective manner. Um, you know, we really do hope that this is a book that nonprofit organizations, grassroots groups, community based organizations can engage. Um, you know, the hope is that we're able to share some. Um, guide uh, some uh, templates or sort of gui guiding uh, questions or curriculum that maybe uh, organizations can um, also adopt in their own kind of political education work. I'm hoping to kind of try something out in the coming weeks because I've just been invited by an organization to do some training with them. So hoping to be able to make this kind of um, not, uh, these resources available uh, on, on, on this website. So please follow, uh, keep, keep, um, abreast of any updates uh, that come through on the website. Uh, just to lift up what makes this book different really as Eddie has already articulated is that uh, we, you know, even though this is a university press, even though the, you know, as editors, Diane and I are primarily working as scholars and, and working in the university, we both uh, wanted to center the knowledge of those on the ground, that we value the knowledge uh, that organizers bring to the table, that they have a real sharp analysis of what the issues, you know, what, what uh, confronts us in the, um, in the world today. They have a sharp analysis of structures of power and domination, and more than that, they offer us um, understand uh, visions of change, real lessons around uh, praxis. So, you know, that really, I think, uh, stand, makes this book stand apart, I think, from other kinds of books, academic books that might be um, uh, engaging or, or trying to kind of highlight Asian American activism. I mean, I think for, for me, one of the things that, um, and, and I, I said mentioned earlier, I, I made multiple contributions as a writer to the to the book, but one of the contributions in addition to the introduction and the chapter I wrote on my own student organizing was a reflection in the epilogue on the organizing of my, my son, Amado Kaya Canem Rodriguez. Actually, it was in the midst of really finalizing the revisions for this book that we actually got the very, very tragic news um, that Amado had passed. Mara was in the Philippines. He had been in the Philippines for two years, uh, working alongside indigenous peoples in the Philippines. He was very much inspired by uh, a kind of exposure program, much like uh, what uh, Rhonda had uh, discussed earlier. Um, and you know, in his work, he was biracial, black, and Filipino. Uh, he was doing work at the intersection of his identities as as uh, as somebody who identified as black and also as Asian American. Did a lot of work. Um, uh, very much on, on the campus. He, he is, uh, many people say he's responsible for having successfully uh, fought 
uh, further gentrification of the city of Oakland in his organizing uh, as a college student in Laney against the, the uh, A's Coliseum construction. Um, and then he ended up after uh, having this opportunity to learn directly from indigenous communities, wanting to commit uh, a part of his life as a young person uh, to learn even further from them and to work alongside them. And so I guess one of the things I hope, you know, and I think a lot of the contributors of the book uh, felt was important about the Amato story and why I was invited to share that epilogue was because in a lot of ways, he exemplified some of the most beautiful um, lessons of our movements. You know, he was the son of activists. He learned directly from movement elders in the uh, black radical tradition and the Philippinex tradition. Uh, it, just the way he moved as an organizer really offers, in a, even though, uh, you know, he ended up losing his life uh, and, and, and mainly because uh, uh, he, he died of food poisoning. It's kind of a death that's far too common for many indigenous peoples, uh, never mind the fact that they also deal with state violence. Um, but he really kind of lived his life in a way that I think many um, in the, of the contributors and I think so many people who've heard about him sto his story, it's so inspiring that we hope that Gen Zers in particular, as somebody who was of the Gen Z generation might be able to kind of um, learn from and be inspired by. So with that, um, thank, you know, we have some time still for questions. I see some great questions um, already popping up, I think, in the chat. So I'll just le leave it to you, Janie, to pick um, a question to pose to us. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we are going to open the floor up for questions, um, so feel free to drop them. I'll also be looking at YouTube for questions. Um, so the first question is from Sung Kim. And they asked, how does Asian American activism and this book address disparate representations of the API community in their activist work? Um, and spe especially as it pertains to class. And I think to sort of maybe add on to that question, um, it's sort of how do you bring in and engage folks um, into um, this activism work, folks who are coming from different levels of understanding and commitment. So. Uh, whoever wants to speak up on that, feel free to. Uh, I guess I can start. So for Bind USA, we're a multi-sectoral alliance. And so we uh, have organizations of workers, of women, of youth, of um, artists, uh, human rights advocates, and others. And so uh, we have very intentionally uh, try to cross those boundaries that the person who asked the question was talking about, even within our own community. So kind of centering on um, all people, you know, in the Philippine diaspora can be part of this movement to change the conditions, to change, um, uh, yeah, the, the conditions that keep our country poor uh, can be part of the, the movement. Um, you know, and I think in the question that was asked, there was a particularity around, um, you know, voices of poor people and working class people. Uh, and those are the very people that bear the brunt of the kind of um, uh, uh, repression that we see, bear the brunt of neoliberalism today, bear the brunt of war in the world, right? Uh, and so um, we, you know, ensure that we're organizing working people, workers, um, kind of as a, a central focus of what we do so that um, their voices, the people on the very front lines, you know, of um, the crisis today are the people who are um, the leaders of the organizations are the people telling the story are the people organizing others um and you know are, are the people who uh we interview in our chapter in the book uh and from what you know i hear about the other chapters you know they're the same people you know the people leading the struggles are among the most uh oppressed and so i think that's one of the uh, unique contributions of the book is that it does seek to tear down those kinds of boundaries um, that could be drawn between people Yeah, um, I'll weigh in just briefly on other chapters in this book. I mean, Eddie has spoken to prisons, Karen Umemoto's um, chapter speaks to um, mostly Native Hawaiians who are going through the juvenile justice system in Hawaii, right? I talked about the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, but I want to lift up a couple of other chapters that also speak to the working class Asian America. One is by Mei Fu, who's on this um, 
in this meeting. And she, one of the groups that she looked at was Adakar, which is a Nepalese women-led organization in New York City and Queens. And um, they're organizing mostly immigrant women, domestic and nail salon workers. Um, they're dealing with, um, ma many of them are on temporary protected status, right? Um, as refugees or undocumented. Um, and she was looking at the kind of political education organizing that they do, as well as the, the organizing for, for justice that they do. So we, we were trying to um, have a range of groups that we're looking at. And then I also want to, note that Alex Tom and Pam Tao Lee both work or work with the Chinese Progressive uh, Association in San Francisco. And some of the work that, they, a lot of the work that they're doing are around uh, tenant rights in Chinatown, in San Francisco Chinatown. They're working with um, a working class uh, Chinese immigrants and, and Asian American immigrants. And so there, there, there is a focus on on different class formations. I mean, we're also looking at students. There's quite a bit on young youth organizing and student organizing, um, some of whom are middle class. But in, in any case, I think that um, th there is a focus in this book, and the, as Rhonda was talking about, that centers um, economic justice in addition to racial justice. Um, I want to add one thing about the undocumented Korean activism. There was some time when the leaders and um, initiatives of this activism were more led and facilitated by the um, previous generation, the senior generation of immigrant rights movements. But as DACA came out, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and many um, young generation were able to get some, even temporarily, some protection uh, from being deported by the state. It helped many undocumented Korean and Asian activists to meet with other um, colleagues and their peer groups so that they were able to expand their conversations and hope around um, like making their activism more radical. DACA has never been a perfect um, policy. It is still really like emphasizing the neoliberal values such as efficiency, productivity, and quote unquote moral characters of the young undocumented immigrants. But still it um positively affected in um like enlarging the pool of this activism so that they were able to pave in more progressive way. So for now at Nakase for instance, we are really believed in the values that our activism should be led and facilitated, designed by the most impacted people. As a result, now one of our co-executive director in Nakasek is the undocumented Korean um, immigrant, young adult, and also our board chair is also undocumented Korean immigrant. And it is not the, um, the end of the story, but there has been this effort so that like we do not let this, some activism to be led by more, for instance, experienced and quote unquote elite activist, but um, try to redistribute the leadership and initiatives to be more read by the most impacted people. Thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you so for your question. Um, it reminds me of that one phrase where um, it says those closest to the problem are also those closest to the solution. So we have another question from Grace Chu, a student from Professor Fugino's class. Um, they write, I know social justice work is not a job that you can just go home and walk away from. And I am sure the work can weigh on everyone's mind very heavily. Um, the question is, how do you separate your work life to everyday life in terms of mental wellness and et cetera? So maybe um, Robin, you can take a stab at that question. Yeah, thank you for that, Jamie. And thank you so much for the question, Grace. Uh, Amy, one thing is, at least for me, um, you know, my organizing uh, isn't delimited to the, the fact of my job as a professor. I often say that the university just happens to pay me, but my work is, um, is to continue to work to advance the, the, the work of advancing justice. And, um, and what that means then is, you know, I think it's so much a part of, you know, um, at least, and I think it might be true for uh, other folks on the call, the totality of, um, of our lives, not just kind of 
um, the time we put in um, at our paid jobs, where we may not even be necessarily exercising our political work primarily. You know, for instance, again, I get paid by a university, but my political work or my political home may not be the university. It may be the university and other spaces. So there's that. But actually, I think one of the things that um, uh, in terms of real amazing and important lessons that I think the Gen Zers have given us is this attention to mental health. And that's why I'm so thankful that you raised that question. That was certainly something that um, I learned from, from my son Amato. You know, as somebody who was uh, uh, the child of two activists, I think he could see and he would often call us out, uh, his parents around the, the ways that um, the intensity of our, our work as organizers, uh, what, to, how it was impacting us, how it was creating certain kinds of traumas for us as individuals that could sometimes also manifest in the, in the, in the space of the family. And so I think that what, what I appreciate from this newer generation is this attention to mental health and well-being. You know, a lot of uh, what we unfortunately learn from our elders, if there, there are lessons to be learned, it's all also the lessons not to repeat, which was that this, this idea that you sacrifice yourself so completely um, and that your commitment was measured to basically by how little sleep you got, how, um, you know, how you were willing to work no matter how sick and ill you were. I mean, it was a kind of, you know, um, all and or nothing, you know, sort of lesson I'd seen uh, modeled by, by many of my elders. And I felt like I had to do the same. Um, but I also have seen those same elders struggle really hard with their health and old age, how it's also made them bitter and resentful. Um, it is true. The work we do as social justice organizers is heavy work. And it does require um, that we commit individually as well as collectively to the work of wellness and healing. We have to do that work, even as we're doing this work of um, calling out um, all of the ways that uh, uh, structures of power and domination hurt and harm us. We also have to do the work of amplifying all of the ways that we, we, we resist and we have to also uh, do the work of, of carving out uh, spaces of, of radical love, uh, spaces of collective care, uh, where we can also model a way of being with one another and help each other in, in our healing. And, and I think that's work that we still have yet to develop, frankly, in our movement spaces. And definitely that's sort of a, a transition I'm trying to really do in my own organizing, I'm working with other organizing across the uh, organizers across the country around devising healing justice programs meant specifically for folks who work in nonprofit spaces, grassroots groups and co uh, community based organizations. Um, we even as part of the Amato Kaya Foundation that we really that we just recently kind of uh, established, we actually have a retreat home that we've been gifting to organizers to activists um, artists just as a space of rest because we know that there's so few opportunities for folks at the front lines of fighting um, injustice to just have a chance to, to take that breath that Eddie always reminds us to do, um, to take that, uh, that pause. So, um, you know, I think that's a wonderful lesson that we're learning from this newer generation about the importance of these drawing these healthy boundaries, doing this work of collective care, rooting our work in radical love. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Robin. May I jump in really quickly? Others may want to respond to this question, but as we get to towards the end of this program, I wanted to invite people. I'm really wanting to hear what the ideas in this panel, um, if you've read the book, the ideas from the book, the meanings of Asian American activism and organizing, what it means to you. So if you would just put in the chat, kind of, uh, you know, what, what it means to you to be learning about Asian American activism and what parts of the things that we talked about are, are most meaningful to you. Um, if you could just throw that in the chat, I would, we would, it would help us so much to understand and learn from you. Um, and I want to throw out one thing, which is this book by Resma Menekin called My Grandmother's Hands. And it looks at the ways that racial traumas, white supremacy is really an embodied experience. So he looks at this kind of like white body supremacy he talks about. And so I just want to encourage people to look at that um, because as Robin's talking about, and as I know Eddie talks about so much, you get talking about healing from trauma. 
Um, right, this is the work that we all need to be doing, especially as we went through the pandemic and all the racial violence that we saw, um, but, but so much even before that, right? R Rhonda's talking about things that have happened in the Philippines for decades. Um, anyways, it is, I really wanna encourage people to find their collective and self-care practices. Thank you so much. Um, if we, uh, let's see, there's a comment from the group um, chat. So from Alice, um, API activism is a daily radical and important act for me. It is something I hope to show continuously in my own work through my voice and in the artistic amplification of youth voices in particular. So thank you so much, Alice. And I think that's a nice way to conclude our um, Q&A and panel event for today. Um, there is so much more to be um, talked about and discussed, but unfortunately, we're just limited to an hour and a half. Um, so with that, we are go I'll hand it over to Harvey to close. Well, before Harvey close, I, I just want to say, um, you know, thank you, Harvey, for all that, you know, work that you have put in, um, you know, to create space for us to lead by example uh, in many ways. And just want to honor you when you're still with us, you know, um, and definitely your partner B, right? Uh, you, 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 like I said, you led by example. You know? And then uh, the other thing I want to share, you know, with everyone is that it's always bigger than all of us, any one individual, right? So anytime that we, we get sidetracked, we have to come back to that breath to understand that everything our elders and our ancestors that who have paid the way and created is all bigger than them. So everything that we're doing is bigger than all of, of any one individual. It's all of us, right? And then I, I'll just close by again, wishing uh, Guy Young a happy birthday. Yes, happy birthday, Guy Young. Thank you so much for joining us on this panel today on your birthday. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for writing the book, uh, for all your reflections on this today's panel. You know, the, it really shows interconnects and it provides important lessons in building solidarity. You know, and 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 the other thing is, you know, we're we're in this for the long haul, and I think the book uh, provides us with a lot of strategic tips you know, about how to survive, you know, because uh, definitely, you know, the world's going through tremendous changes. And by your writing and reflecting and, and us discussing all this stuff, it, it, it really does help prepare us, you know, for the future, you know. So contemporary Asian American activism will be kind of like a book one of the future. <laughs> but uh, Thanks for attending. And if you want to purchase the book, uh, it's available at Eastwind Books of Berkeley, www.asiabookcenter.com. And the other thing is what I want to make an announcement is that um, on March 5th, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. on Zoom, uh, there's going to be a book talk with uh, Jetta Grace Martin, Joshua Bloom, and Waldo E. Martin Jr. Uh, the book is titled Freedom, the Story of the Black Panther uh, Party, and it's based on archival research. Uh, there was a man named H.K. Uh, Ewan um, <clears throat> who used to videotape every single Black Panther event in the Bay Area, a Chinese man who was a graduate student at UC Berkeley. He gave, his, his whole, gave up his whole career to document the movement. You know, so uh, his archives are at the Ethnic Studies Library at UC Berkeley, and the book uh, uses a lot of these archives, you know, to document the Black Panthers, uh, freedom, the story of the Black Panther Party. And then the other thing is that it's written for mass appeal. It's actually geared toward young adult readers. And um, the main lead person is Jetta uh, Grace Martin, who uh, gra just graduated uh, recently and um, uh, join us then, you know, March 5th, 
uh, to the 3 p.m. Yeah. Thank you so much, Harvey. Um, and we also encourage you to fill out our event survey. We love to get your feedback on how we can continue to improve our events and also see what kind of events you guys are interested in. And so lastly, to conclude, um, I hope that one of the main takeaways from this book and from today's talk is that to not only learn about Asian American activism, but to be involved in it and to be in the community, building deep and sustained uh, relationships and learn in, a, learn in ways you can't in a traditional classroom. So very much in line with the value of practice, uh, praxis, our panelists have shared with you the organizations they are a part of and they support. So if you can, please tap into these incredible resources and the work that is going on. Um, you can take a picture or a screenshot of this slide. I know it's a lot of information, but it will also be sent out in a follow-up email along with the event recording um, if you have RSVP'd through the event page. So thank you so much. Um, that concludes our event. Thank you once more to our panelists for such a rich and um, reinvigorating conversation and for sharing your experiences and knowledge with, with us all. I know I have learned a lot um, and thank you the audience for tuning in and I hope we can all um, continue to organize broadly and boldly, which is something that Jessica Antonio, one of the contributors of the book wrote. So thank you all so much and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.